Jesus. Open your Bibles this morning to Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, the book of the preacher written by Solomon under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. We'll begin reading with verse number 1 of chapter 3. To everything there is a season and a time, to every purpose under the heaven. A time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to pluck up that which is planted, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to break down and a time to build up, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones together, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to get and a time to lose, a time to keep and a time to cast away. A time to rend and a time to sow, a time to keep silence and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate, a time of war and a time of peace. Now in its literal meaning, in these eight verses, the Holy Spirit is telling us that in the all-wise counsel of God, that he has a time for everything under the sun. That means he has a time for you, a time for your miracle, a time for your prayer to answer. The problem with the church is we have a tendency to get ahead of God's time or get behind God's time. And we've got to understand that God's timing is just as important as God's will. If you don't believe what I'm saying, all you have to do is study the life of Job, the life of Moses, the life of Joseph, the life of David, the life of Esther. I could go on and on and on, but just look at the life of Jesus. The Scripture said that in the fullness of time, Christ was born, which meant that he was born not one day early and not one day late. But he was born the exact time and the exact place that God had preordained. Now, I said all of that because that's not what I'm going to be dealing with in the message. I want to take this first verse from another perspective, and I've titled this message, Now is the Season. Now is the Time. Now is the Season, and now is the time. This morning, I want to speak to our nation. For those of you that are watching from outside of the borders of the United States, we, will, we are in the midst of an election cycle. And in November, we will elect a new president to serve as the leader of this country. And I want to address myself this morning, not to that, but to the civic responsibility that every single Christian has, the duty that we have as a Christian and as a citizen of this nation. Every one of us has a duty and a responsibility to be a good citizen. And all that it entails. And that also means participating in the election process. I've asked the ushers, I want them right now to bring, before I pray, I want them to bring our flag. I love this flag. This flag stands for freedom. This flag stands for the country that has done more for Western civilization than any other country. Just set it right there. I want to keep it before you this morning. Somebody might say, oh, are you one of those patriotic people? You bet I am. And I'm proud of it. Now is the season. Now is the time. Would you bow your heart, heads, please? Father, we come before you in the name of your son, Jesus. We thank you for the spirit of the Lord that we have sensed in this service. I ask for your help this morning. Anoint me to deliver this word. Take it to the hearts of your people, not only here, but those that are watching and listening in this great nation. I would ask that it would ring true to their heart and their mind. 
And we give you all the praise and all the glory. And everybody said, amen and amen. Every time you see this flag, it is more than just a symbol of our nation. This flag represents the blood that was shed, the sacrifice that was paid, the blood, the sweat, the tears given by our forefathers to make this the greatest nation on the planet earth. Oh, that's pitiful, church. That's pitiful. Every time you lay your head down to sleep on your pillow, you're laying your head down on a pillow backed by freedom. Freedom that was guaranteed to us by blood, sweat, and tears. That's what that flag represents. It stands for hope to the hopeless. It stands for food for the hungry. Water for the thirsty. Medicine for those that are sick. It stands for freedom for the people of the nation that don't know what freedom is. And we have a debt that we owe to every man and woman that has paid the ultimate sacrifice and giving their life to guarantee us this freedom. And we should never, ever take for granted the freedom that we have. You could have been born anywhere in the world, but you were born in the United States of America. And if you were born in the United States of America, you should be a proud American. And if you're not a proud American... The door swings both ways. Go find somewhere else to live. We are not the cause of all the problems in the world. I'm tired of our politicians apologizing. What do we have to apologize for? We have paid with blood the most precious commodity to free Europe. Southeast Asia, Korea, and the list goes on and on, the Pacific Islands. And we've never asked for anything but give us a piece of ground to bury our dead. So quit apologizing. I'm sick of it. Give us politicians that will stand up and say, I'm proud to be an American. I remember when I, the week I turned 18 years old, a long time ago, I'm 61 now. I received the letter that every one of that age group received during that time. It was marked federal government. Underneath it, selective service. It was during the Vietnam War. It was my notice that I had to register for the draft. I can still remember when I held that letter in my hand. Now, I, I knew that the odds of me being drafted were very, very small because we were de-escalating. We were sending more men home than we were sending over. And I could tell by the way things were going that the war would be ended very soon. I also knew that as being an only child and the only male heir that can continue the name of Swagger, that if I was drafted, that I would probably be sent somewhere like Germany or South Korea or based here in the United States. Somebody asked me one time, because the Vietnam War was so controversial, would you have gone if drafted? Of course I would. Whether you agree or disagree, when your country calls, you answer. And one of the greatest... And one of the greatest shames upon this nation's conscience is the way that we treated our Vietnam veterans when they came home. We owe an apology to every single man and woman that served in Vietnam. Instead of coming home to marching bands, 
Instead of coming home to the applause and the pride of a grateful nation, too many spit on you and called you baby killers. That is a sin. Those people will have to answer for that. You didn't ask to go there. You didn't ask to lose an arm or a leg or to have your body burned by napalm. But you went because your country called. And we thank you and we owe you a debt of gratitude to all of our Vietnam veterans. We salute you, and we thank you for your service. We thank you for everything that you did, whether you agreed or didn't agree. We thank you. And I remember driving downtown, going into the courthouse, and walking in and registering. Then the next thing that I did was I walked across the hall, and I registered to vote. 18 years old. And I can re still remember when I registered to vote, the feeling that came over me that said, I get to have the opportunity to have a voice in the affairs of our nation. I get to have a voice in who serves in the White House. And I want you to know, I want to make this statement. We're not here to serve the president. The president is elected by the people to serve the best interests of the people. Not the best interests of a political party, but the best interests of the nation. Now, we do not endorse candidates. Matter of fact, the only time in my history as a pastor that I've ever said anything directly about a candidate was in the 1980s when a former Grand Wizard of the Ku Klux Klan received the Republican nomination for the, to run for governor. He received the, the nomination of the Republican Party to run as governor of the state of Louisiana. And I remember he got up and in speeches he was telling everybody that he had changed his ways and that was behind him and he was a very smart individual in that right before, one week before the election, excuse me, a couple of days before the election, Sunday fell, and he bought statewide an hour of time to give a statewide speech to try to stake his case that he was not who he used to be. I'm a Christian now. See, here's what you got to understand. When it comes to election time, everybody's a Christian. And I listened to what he had to say with great intent before the service. It, was, it ran from, uh, I said an hour is 30 minutes. It ran from 5 to 5.30. I listened to the whole speech. And I remember telling Debbie, I said, that man's a liar. He has not changed one iota. He is a wolf in sheep's clothing. I can feel his spirit. His spirit is not right. There is a spirit of deception upon him. And that night, I stood up on this platform, the only time in an election. I asked how many had seen the speech, and almost every hand was raised. And I told the people, I cannot tell you what to do, but even though I am a conservative, and if you're a true Christian, you are a conservative. And I told our people, I'm not here to tell you who to vote for. I will never ask you who you vote for in this election. But I'm here to tell you, I cannot and will not vote for the Republican nominee for governor of the state of Louisiana because I don't believe a word he says. And I will vote for his opponent. And it turned out that we were right. We found out after the election, the supposed change, we found out that he still owned a bookstore in New Orleans selling racist books, selling Mein Kampf and other horrible books. So the point I'm trying to make here is people, you got to pay attention. You got to know what's going on. And that's the only time 
that I've ever said anything personal about a candidate as far as an election. So this morning, I'm not here to endorse a political party. I'm not here to endorse a particular candidate. I do not do that publicly. I, you will never know who I vote for until after the election and only then if you ask me. And number two, I will never ask you who you vote for. That's your business. But what I am here to do this morning is to tell you that as a child of God, that we have to be part of the system. That we have to be engaged. That we have to be involved. There is too much at stake to sit back with our head in the sand and our hands in our pockets and do nothing. I got one email. Y'all should be quiet about that. God has everything under control. My answer to that is this. If God has everything under control, then let's just shut down every church. Because God has everything under control. Let's stop the printing of all Bibles. Matter of fact, let's take all Bibles out of circulation because God has everything under control. Let's take all missionaries off the field and bring them home because God has everything under control. Oh, better yet, let's stop all Christian programming, television, radio, internet, because God has everything under control. That is the dumbest, the stupidest, the most ignorant, the most asinine statement that anybody that calls himself a Christian should could make God works through people God works through people he calls people he raises people up Matthew 5 13 says that you are the salt of the earth but if the salt has lost his savor wherewith shall it be salted it is therefore good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden under the foot of men. You are the light of the world, a city that is set on a hill that cannot be hid. Now notice he said, first of all, the Lord. These are the words of the Lord. He said, we are the salt of the earth. Salt speaks of preservation. It's a type of the word of God. It preserves but it is also a type of the child of God. In this land, in this world, we are to be salt. We are here to preserve the work of God. Now, do you understand that? You have a responsibility to be the salt of the earth, to act as preservation for that which is right in all areas of life spiritual physical financial domestic and emotional now do you understand that but he said if the salt has lost its savor what good is it the church has lost its savor in the united states because most of the church has departed from the word of almighty god The cross, the blood is not mentioned in most churches in America today. Sin is not preached on. Hell is not preached on. Well, I want you to know this is a blood church. I want you to know this is a cross church. This is a church that still believes uh, that that if you sin, you're going to go to hell if you don't repent. We believe there's a heaven. We believe there's a hell. We believe the child of God is going to heaven. And the person that refuses to accept Jesus Christ no matter how good their works may be they will spend eternity in hell the church is so mixed up people can't get saved until you tell them they're a sinner and then how to get saved sick bodies cannot be healed unless healing is preached believers cannot be baptized in the Holy Spirit unless preachers preach on the Holy Spirit Sanctification cannot be realized if preachers don't understand the message of the cross and preach that it's not our good works that sanctify us, but it is our faith in the atoning work of Jesus Christ. His blood not only justifies, but His blood sanctifies, and it's our faith in what He has already done that sanctifies us. I can't earn my sanctification. 
the sermons I preach does not earn my sanctification. All the prayer I pray, all the Bible scriptures, all of that. We turn Christian grace into law. When we think that the doing of things merits us anything, we deserve eternal doom and judgment. But thank God, through His Son, Jesus Christ, the price has been paid and the way has been made plain. And whosoever will that will come, he will accept and in no wise cast out. Somebody needs to shout. No wise will he cast anyone out. Hallelujah. He said, you're the light of the world. You are the light. Not the church, we are the church, and I speak of denominations. Denominations are not the light of the world. Religious organizations is not the light of the world. Jesus Christ is the light of the world, and the true child of God that stands for righteousness and holiness is the light of the world. That means we're to let our light shine. It's amazing. We got a lot of James Bond Christians. Secret agent 007. They come to church and they run, they jump, they shout. But their neighbors don't know they're saved. The people on the job never hear you talk about the Lord. They don't know that you're a child of God. We don't need any more 007s. We need some 777s. Men and women that will stand up and say, I am a child of God, whether you like it or not. I serve the one true God, and his name is Jesus Christ. It's not Buddha. It's not Muhammad. It's not Allah. It's not Confucius. It's not a billion gods worshipped by religions in the world. But at the same time, we don't try to force ourselves on people. Now, do you understand that? You cannot force a person into salvation. You love them. The basis of Christian evangelism has always been love the sinner, but hate the sin. Now, do you understand that? We don't approve of the lifestyle, but we love the person. And it's wrong For the child of God to call those in the world that are bound by certain sins, crude names and slurs. It is wrong. We are to treat the sinner with the same respect that we want to be treated. Whether they accept what we have to say or not, we are still spitting in our face. We're still to smile and tell them the Lord Jesus Christ loves them. And I will not lift my voice or my hand in a negative way against you. I'm going to tell you I love you, but I'm still going to tell you that if you don't repent, that eternal doom awaits you. But if you will just call upon the one name that counts, the name of Jesus. He will wash away every sin and every stain and welcome you into the kingdom no matter what you have done. But we've let the light go out. All you got to do is turn on so-called Christian television. There's no light. A city set on a hill that cannot be hid. The Lord is just using an obvious statement. If there's a city sitting on a hill, you don't need a sign saying there's a city on the top of the hill. You see it. He's saying here, our consecration should be so obvious to everybody that we're around that we don't even have to say we're a Christian. They know that we are a Christian by the way we conduct ourselves and the way we act. So a man wrote me an email the other day and he said, Preachers! should never say anything about politics. That's, that's so ignorant. That's nonsense. Because the fact of the matter is, the true God-called shepherd is the only qualified person in the nation that can speak on the affairs and the issues of the nation. Are, are you saying that you're more qualified than a politician? That's right. 
That's exactly right. I'm more qualified to speak upon the issues of the day than every single Democratic candidate, every single Republican candidate, because my worldview is not shaped from a narrow political prism, but it's shaped by the word of Almighty God. I have the answer for war. I have the answer for hate. I have the answer for poverty. I have the answer that every nation needs, and it's not more money. It's Jesus Christ. I want to say that again. Every true God-called preacher is more qualified to speak to the issues of the nation than any single person in Washington, D.C. that is not born again. 1 Chronicles 12, 32 says that There were in Israel that God raised up men who had an understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do. That's what we need today, men. I don't care what color their skin is. I don't care whether their church is big or small. We need men and women who have an understanding of the times to know what the United States of America should do. And you can't have an understanding of the times without reading your Bible and seeking the face of God. I want to give you some history this morning. I want to be a history teacher. Is that okay? Because I want to go back to the man's statement that he made to me just about 10 days ago or less that preachers should not say anything about politics. I hope you're watching. I don't remember your name. But I hope you're watching because I'm going to give you a very short, simple, all of you, American history lesson. I want to take you back. It was January the 21st, 1775 in the little town of Woodstock, Virginia. Woodstock, Virginia is at the top of the state, not far from the West Virginia border. It was a Sunday morning. A pastor stepped up to preach. It was the custom in those days that ministers wore clerical robes, black robes. That was the custom, whether they were Antibaptist, whether they were Methodist, whether they were Episcopalian, Presbyterian, they wore robes. This pastor's name, and I love this, his name was John Peter Gabriel Muhlenberg. Now, if if you're a preacher and your name... John Peter Gabriel, you better have something to say when you get up behind the pulpit. Hello? He opened his Bible and he took for his text Ecclesiastes 3. The same eight verses that I read to you. When he finished, he said, and he declared in the message, in the language of the Holy Writ... There is a time for all things. He said, there is a time to preach, and there is a time to fight. And now is the time to fight. He then stepped back. In dramatic flair, he pulled off his clerical robe, and underneath he was wearing the officer's uniform of the Continental Army of the United States of America, or the then coming United States of America. He said, as the shepherd of this house, I must do more than just say words. But it's time that we throw off the tyranny of a nation that is trying to tax us to death without any representation. And whoever wants to join me in this holy fight, step out and join me. And he walked out of the church and just about every able-bodied man stepped up, walked out behind him. He became a colonel in the Virginia militia fighting in almost every battle of the Revolutionary War. So what do you say? I'm telling you, brother, this thing started in the church. The cry for freedom started in the church. Let me, do you get it? The cry for freedom started in the church. I'll prove it even more. On March the 23rd, 7075, when Patrick Henry spoke the now famous phrase, give me liberty 
or give me death. To arouse the Second Virginia Convention to arms against the tyranny of Great Britain. He noted that we have done everything that could be done to avert the storm which is now coming upon us. During the critical years of 1775 and 1776, the American colonies had been forced to endure taxation without representation, searches and seizures without probable cause, the confiscation of firearms, and on and on. Though the colonial leaders had tried to remain loyal to the crown and reconcile their differences, they were finally compelled to break away and revolt. The Declaration of Independence was then written as a proclamation to the world for their reasons for separating from England. Let me stop there. I want to say to England, I love you. I love England. London is my favorite city in the world outside of any city in the United States of America. We're cousins. So the past is the past. So don't get mad at anything Pastor Donnie is saying right now. It happened a long time ago, okay? But while the Declaration gives a detailed list of legal offenses that England had left unresolved, now listen to this, the founders saw these as more than isolated wrongs. Rather, they saw them as a part of a predetermined plan to take away their religious liberties and reestablish the Church of England to rule over their hearts and souls, thus enslaving the colonies. In that light, one understands the power of Patrick Henry's fiery words. Faced with such prospects, the Declaration stated that the American colonists were set to defend the laws of nature and of nature's God. That means our founding fathers recognized that there was a God in heaven. They believed in Jesus Christ. They believed in God the Father. Now, that doesn't mean all of our founding fathers were saved. They were not. There were deists. Benjamin Franklin, Thomas Jefferson, Thomas Paine. They were deists. What does deist mean? A deist is a person that believes in God. He believes there is a God. He, but they do not believe that God involves himself in the affairs of man. They didn't believe in miracles. They didn't believe in divine inspiration. They believed that God gave us a brain and we were expected to use common sense. That's why the book Common Sense was written. So they were not deniers of God in spite of what reformed history is teaching. Well, I take that back. They're not even teaching history anymore. The average high school and college graduate doesn't have the slightest idea how this country was founded. But even though there were some deists, they all recognized that a nation could not be formed and a constitution could not be written unless it was based on the foundation of the word of Almighty God. I could prove that over and over and over by their statements. Faced with such prospects, the Declaration stated that the American colonists were set to defend the laws of nature and of nature's God. Words that defined the principle upon which the founders stood. The laws of nature were understood to mean the will of God for man as revealed to man's reason. However, because man has fallen. And his reason does not always comprehend this law. God gave his law in the Bible to make it absolutely clear. That's why they said we can have no freedom unless the Bible is the basis of our freedom in this new country. Now listen, thus it was the churches. That became the primary source that stirred the fires of liberty. Telling the colonists that the English government was usurping their God-given rights. And the king and parliament were violating the laws of God. The founding fathers were convinced that it was their sacred duty to start a revolution to uphold the law of God against the unjust and oppressive laws of men. 
And to fight for political liberty was seen as a sacred cause because civil liberty was an unalienable right according, an inalienable right according to God's natural law. The New England ministers in particular were divisive in rally, decisive in rallying the popular moral support for war against England. They pressed their congregations to overthrow King George because they believed that rebellion to, tri to tyrants was obedience to God. From many pulpits, ministers recruited troops and strengthened them in battle with patriotic sermons. While the church leaders were well-schooled, and the fact that the Bible placed great emphasis on due submission to civil authorities, Romans 13, chapter 13. They noted that there are also many passages that approve resistance to ungodly authority. For instance, when the apostles were commanded by the Sanhedrin to cease preaching that Jesus Christ had risen from the dead, Peter boldly asserted, we ought to obey God rather than man. It's Acts 5, 29. That tells us today that as an American citizen, we are to obey the laws of this land as long as those laws do not infringe or try to override the word of Almighty God. We must never bow the knee to that. We must stand strong for the truth of God's word. It doesn't matter what Congress says. It doesn't matter what a president says. It doesn't matter what our senators say. It doesn't doesn't matter what the Supreme Court says. We obey the word of Almighty God. And if that puts me in jail, so be it. Therefore, it is no consequence, no coincidence that one of the watchwords, listen to this. Therefore, it is no coincidence that one of the watchwords of the American Re Revolution was no king but King Jesus. Amen. That was on the lips of our men as they fought to bring us liberty. No king but King Jesus. I'm going to say that again. There's no king but King Jesus. There is no king, but King Jesus. There is no king, but King Jesus. Oh, you're not here, church. There is no king, but King Jesus. He is the King of kings. He is the Lord of lords. He is the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning, the end, the one who always was and is and always shall be. No king, but King Jesus. For most of the patriots, their faith gave them the courage to stand on God's word and risk their lives and properties to break the tyranny of an unjust human authority. In their Christian worldview, obedience to God took precedent over country or government, and their primary allegiance was to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, sir, that's my answer to you about whether or not preachers should not speak about political issues. Because you see, you understand something, church. To the child of God, everything is spiritual. Now, do you understand that? Every single thing. We don't set them like, this is political. This is social. This is economical. This is military. And so we put all of that in the corner and we keep spiritual. No, 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 no. To the child of God, everything is spiritual because everything that I just said, if the church is not the church and we stand silent, then those things begin to encroach upon the church and it hurts the work of God. Do you... Do do you not understand that church? You're to what you're talking about will hurt the work of God to stand back and do nothing. You were called by God for a time such as this. Now is the season. Now is the time. Now is the season. Now is the time. I get so irritated when you're Christian. Well, if my candidate don't get the nomination, I'm not voting. Yes, you are voting. Your no vote is a yes vote for the wrong candidate. 
Quit acting like an eight-year-old that gets mad and takes his ball and goes home and sucks his thumb and pouts all day. Well, my guy didn't get the nomination. Good gracious. Is the church still wearing diapers? They are because I've changed too many of them. It's time the church, listen, listen. We are once again in this nation in a struggle for the freedoms and the liberties that have made this country great. This is not a struggle of guns and bullets and battle and war and navy. No, it's not any of that. It's not a physical struggle, but we are in a spiritual struggle. We are in a spiritual struggle for the very soul of our nation. You you know, I, I talked about being 18 and being proud to know I can vote. Now at 61, I look back at the fact of some of the 18, 19, 20, and 21-year-olds we have today, and I'm scared to death for them to walk into a polling booth. I mean, we, we, when you've got a large percentage in that age group saying that socialism is good, they have no life experience. Let them move to a socialist country and try to live under socialism. We've got, we have created a whole generation of 18 to 25-year-olds that are nothing but big babies. They feel like they're entitled to everything under the sun. Give me a free education. Give me a job paying 100 Listen, keep your hands out of my pocket. I'm not paying for your education. If you can't afford it, go out and get a job and earn your way and get some life experience and quit whining and griping and complaining. We do not owe you nothing but the right to leave you alone. God help us when a junior at the University of Missouri who is the vice president of the student union says, well, people make just, they make too much a big deal of the First Amendment, the right of freedom of speech. I'm tired of people hiding behind free speech. Well, then shut up. The very amendment you're arguing against, you're doing, you, that gives you the right to say stupid things. Did you hear what I said? The very thing she's complaining about is what guarantees her the right to show her ignorance every time she opens her mouth. The very, listen, freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, and freedom to worship as one sees fit are the three most precious freedoms we have and we must not give an inch on any single one of them. The question was asked on the news, how much of your freedom would you give up to the government to guarantee your safety? The government cannot protect you. When you get up in the morning, when you came to church, the government wasn't in the car with you. There wasn't a squad of Navy SEALs around you. When you go home today, there's not going to be a Delta Force walking you home. When you go to bed tonight, the United States Air Force is not going to be flying jets over your house. Nobody can protect you except Jesus Christ. Therefore, we do not give up one inch of the freedom that the men and the women died for and bled for to give us the right to to stand up and speak our mind and to speak our hearts and to worship God as we see fit. That's all we want. Don't tell me how to preach. Don't tell me what I can preach. Don't tell me what I can't preach. Just leave me alone and let me preach the word of God. And I'll shock you. I will fight for your right 
to get on your soapbox and to say whatever dumb thing you want to say. You can call us kooks. You can call us backwards. You can call us rednecks. You can call us whatever you want to call us. But I will fight for your right to put me down any day of the week because I want my right to stand up and say, no, you're wrong. I'm right. We're in a struggle. What they don't understand is if it had, they had their way, there are forces that would take away my right and every preacher's right to speak on sin. We couldn't say that alcohol is a sin. It might offend somebody. Drugs is a sin. Homosexuality. The list goes on and on and on. You can't say anything. We've got to let everybody have their safe space. We got to create a safe space. Don't say that that's violating my safe space. The only safe space you got is in your car or in your house. Outside of that, everything is game, baby. One of the, you know, I love this. One of the universities just recently, I forgot the name of it, but somebody scrawled some things on it promoting one candidate, and all the student body rose up. They all marched on the chance of the president's office. This is supposed to be a safe place. That hurt my feelings because somebody wrote a politician's name in 2016 next to him. Oh, I'm... Thank God the president answered him this way. He walked out with a piece of chalk walked over to where they had wrote that politician's name, knelt down and said, this university stands for free speech. Yeah. See, it used to be the word liberal meant you were tolerant. Now the word liberal means you're intolerant. You're intolerant of every single person that doesn't agree with you. Listen, I'm not, I have no intolerant feelings toward those who do not share my beliefs. They have a right to be wrong. They have a right to be wrong. And you think I'm joking, don't you? I ain't. Everyone should have the right to voice their opinion as long as it's not a voice that calls for the violent overthrow of the government. That's why we've got freedom, a freedom so precious that it allows idiots to take this flag and pour gasoline on it and burn it. They have the freedom to do that, unless I'm there. And I don't care if I burn my hands, nobody's burning the flag if I'm around. They may have the right, but this is too dear to trample on. We're in a struggle, and it's a spiritual struggle. This upcoming election could very well be, singers, musicians, make your way back, the last election that America has to hold on to some vestige of liberty and freedom for the gospel to go out. Oh, you're just going too far, Pastor. Well, when prayer was thrown out of schools, the church did nothing. Look what we have today. When Roe v. Wade was passed, the church did nothing. When Bibles are outlawed in school districts all over America, but the Quran or the Book of Buddha or any other religious book is okay, the church sits back and does nothing. The recent Supreme Court, Supreme Court decision should have shaken us to the core, but sadly the church did nothing. Oh, don't get me started. But now is the season. Now is the time for all good men and women of America 
that value their freedom and who value the Word of God and the Lord Jesus Christ to get involved and engaged. That means if you're not registered to vote, go register. And when it's time to vote, vote. Now, we're never going to have. Churches have it. They can. That's their right to do it. We've never had a voter's drive or voter's registration in this church. We never will. Because I expect you to be adult enough. Without me having to do all the work to set it up for you to register. I expect you to be capable enough to go down and register yourself. Hello? So what do we are to do? Number one, we're to pray. Second Chronicles seven fourteen still says, If my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, then will I forgive their sin, then will I heal their land. We're sick today. We need healing. And the only healing that will mollify the disease of America is the blood of Jesus Christ. And for the church to stand up and be the church. We need men and women of backbone like the early church that when they brought them into the Roman Colosseum and lions were let loose upon them, if they would would not recant their devotion to Jesus Christ, they said, let them tear our bodies to flesh. We will not deny our Lord Jesus Christ. We need men and women of backbone that were burned at the stake because they refused to bow the knee to Catholicism. We need some John Wycliffe's. We need we need some tendals. We need some men and women that have some backbone that says, this is still my country. I still believe in it. And I'm going to do my part. We pray. Number two, we participate. We must be a part of the electoral process. We must vote. Number three, we persevere. We're fighting for the right. And we must never give up. In Luke 9, 62, Jesus said, No man, having put his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom. And finally, we're to educate ourselves. Quit watching The Voice. Quit watching dumb reality shows that are not reality. They're fake. And read a newspaper every once in a while. Read the news. Watch the news. Educate yourself on what the candidates stand for. Oh, my candidate says he's born again. Doesn't mean he is. Doesn't mean she is. Hello? Well, he goes to a Protestant church. That don't mean anything. He can quote John three sixteen. So could probably... Half the sinners in America. Oh, I heard him singing Amazing Grace. You can't be born in America hardly and not know Amazing Grace. Doesn't mean anything. You've got to look at how they voted and where they stood on the issues and where they say they stand on the issues now and see if they've waffled. And then if your candidate doesn't get it, the nomination, then you still vote for the candidate that's closest to your spiritual values. Well, he, he's not a Christian. She's not a Christian. They are not a Christian. Whatever. God can use anybody. If he can use a donkey to preach, he can use... Now is the season. Now is the time. What will you do? Will you stand up and be counted? Or will you put your hands in your pocket and close your eyes and say it'll all work out in the end while souls go to hell? And we find our most precious rights, freedoms, and liberties slowly eroding. I close with this as one famous statement. John Rosenstern will know it concerning one man in Nazi Germany. He said when Hitler rose to power and he went after the 
communist. I didn't say anything because I wasn't a communist. When he went after the trade unions and arrested them, I didn't say anything because I didn't belong to a union. When he went after the Jews, I didn't say anything because I wasn't Jewish. But when he came and arrested me, there was no one to speak up for me. There was no one left. We're it, folks. We're it. We're the conscience of this nation. We're the voice of this nation. If 25 million Christians that didn't vote in the last election would have voted, there might be some things that are law today that wouldn't be a law. I want everyone to stand today. My altar call is very simple. It's an altar call for America. The move of God must begin in our own hearts. We keep praying for a move of God of America, and yet we're not having a move of God in our own hearts. If you want a revival in America, you need to be revived yourself. Revival starts with an individual. I read to you, I quoted to you 2 Chronicles 7, 14. That's going to be our altar call. We're going to pray that the Holy Spirit will get a hold of Christians in America. That they will be vigilant and carry out their duty as good citizens. Once again, I didn't tell you who to vote for. Didn't tell you what party to register with. And just so you know, I'm not a registered Democrat. I'm not a registered Republican. I'm a registered Independent and a registered Christian. And the Christian comes first. I owe no allegiance to any political party. My allegiance is to Jesus Christ. But I want to ask you to step out today. I want you to come fill this front. And we're going to pray for America today. Would you come, please, step out. Oh, how I love Jesus. Come on, step out. Let's fill this front up real quick. Oh, Come on, get up close, move up close so that people can get in. Come on, sing it one more time. Oh, how I love Jesus before we pray. He is to me so wonderful. I challenge every one of you from this day until the election to make the election a matter of prayer. That you ask for the guidance of the Holy Spirit. And that you pray that the church will stand up and be counted. And that they will seek the guidance of the Holy Spirit that you pray that the Holy Spirit would penetrate that apathy. See, that's the problem. Their eyes are covered over with apathy. They don't care anymore. We've got to care, people. We've got to stand for something. 
And we're going to pray that this coming election will not be a hindrance to the work of God. That's it. Yes. But it will be a help yes. to the work of God yes. for the gospel to go out. God. Make Second Chronicles 7.14 a part of your daily life. I'm not saying you got to quote it every day. I'm saying the spirit of it. Let the spirit of the verse rule and reign in your heart and life until election time. Now, I hope I didn't offend anyone this morning, and I mean that very seriously. I hope I didn't step on your... Well, no, I don't want to say that. I just hope I didn't offend you. But I told you the truth. I told you the truth. We have too great of a country to lose it. Now, I want you to lift your hands, and we're going to join our faith together. Father, we come before you in the name of your son, Jesus. We stand as your people. We are the chosen of God. Everyone, no matter the color of their skin that's watching and listening, no matter where they live, no matter their education or their financial, if they are washed in the blood of the lamb, they are the chosen ones of this generation. Father, I'm asking right now that the Holy Spirit would begin to get a hold of them to open their eyes as to what's going on in our country. Uh, that you would give them a vision. That you would give them wisdom. Uh, that you would give them guidance. Uh, that you would give them an understanding of the times to know what America should do. Uh, and then, Lord, that they will influence others uh, of faith uh, to do the same thing. Uh, and this this morning Lord we repent we repent as the people of God for not preaching the gospel like it should be preached for not preaching the word of God like it should be Lord we repent this morning that we've allowed the altar of the Lord to be broken down but Lord there's a generation of children of God that are repairing the altar of the Lord and we're believing that there's a sound of an abundance of rain that is coming that the church the greatest days of the church is not behind it but the greatest day of the church is ahead of it Lord give us wisdom to know what to do give us guidance and we give you all the praise and glory and everybody said amen and amen I want you to sing one more time the battle hymn of the republic as we sang it lift your voices Sing it with them. My eyes have seen the, the glory, glory of the coming of the Lord. He is trampling out the vintage where the grace of wrath are sword. He has loosed the faithful lightning of his terrible with sword. It's true. It's true.
bless the church and God bless the USA. We love you. We'll see you back tonight at 6 o'clock. Glory, glory, hallelujah.